to everyone who is uh, online now back. Uh, this is Riga conference here in uh, Riga. Um, and we, as usually, uh, do talk uh, the conversations uh, after. This is a lunch conversation, a little bit longer than a coffee break conversation. And Andris Sprutz works in a uh, uh, local um, think tank, Latvian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, you are acting director in here, and, and you've been listening all the day. And I saw a little bit... Um, um, dangerous criticism, criticizing Russia without any Russian politician or think tank represented here. And we've been saying that uh, everything is wrong, uh, generally, or you had a uh, different perception. Don't you think that we are a little bit like um, in a position that we know at the best and at most what they should do? And we sometimes forget uh, to listen to Russian explanations and reasons and uh, this, uh, you know, progress that was made and we should be more patient or things like that. Latvians are never in this position. Why? We are now in a secure place, in a NATO. We could think like this. Well, I think that uh, Latvian position was pretty a uh, balanced position which was re uh, presented by uh, Latvian uh, the Secretary of State of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I would not say that there was a huge criticism and exactly as you mentioned, uh, at the moment Latvia has a improvement of relations with Russia and I think we'll look also a little bit differently with less probably insecurity and less uh, some kind of preaching mode. Do you think it's because of NATO shield? I, I think it is. Uh, it is. Uh, it has been a very important development in, in in Latvian security, foreign policy, identity, and thinking. Uh, namely, that uh, we, after joining European Union, NATO, we feel much more secure. We are not in the position of Georgia. We are not in the position of other countries which still aspire to join NATO or EU. But we are part of the. EU and NATO. We are the members. I think this uh, Rubicon River, if you may, is very important. I think this understanding from both sides, and I think we understand it also, Russians actually might understand that we understand it, uh, is, uh, is, is some kind of uh, uh, making us more secure and much more constructive in a way. Of course, there is more global context in a sense, because the global context is that um, there is U.S., uh, Russian reset at the moment. We uh, we see the Polish Russian reset at the moment. We see the number of modernization agendas and uh, and and whole EU uh, Russian modernization agenda. So I think that there is also so some kind of fashion now uh, for uh, more peaceful in a sense, more engaging policies. That's why coming back to the 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 the, the panel, I think it was. Fascinating, very interesting panel, uh, and I would not say that it is a dangerous criticism. It was probably, to some extent, provocative criticism in a sense, or thoughtful criticism. Of course, what would make it more even interesting if there would be not a German representing actually yeah. uh, the some kind of Russian Russian side, advocacy but probably, but probably advocacy exactly. But uh, probably if there would be. S somebody from Russian mainstream. I think that, again, Arkady Moshe did a great job. And, and, and but he wo uh, works and lives now in Finland, is in, in a neutral uh, neighboring uh, country. So yes, he speaks he as a scientist only, pure scientist. Yes, he speaks as a scientist and also he speaks he, as he spoke himself. There are those thru el uh, three elements at the moment happening in Russia. And one of the elements, sort of negative ones, one of the elements or one of the trends is that many educated, uh, intelligent Russians are living the country and he is actu actually one of the representatives of, 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 the, of this um, trend. This is one thing he touched and he also made a point that well they are bringing some money to the European banks, they are paying the gas and the um, oil bill, every country is doing this um, and uh, that we are in this sense okay. We are a little bit like depending from this uh, because there is a great switch in the hands of Russia. On the other hand it brings some revenues back to Europe so we are not uh, really as demanding uh, this democratic change as we were, let's say, uh, 10 uh, maybe years uh, before. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm talking this uh, feeling what was in a whole but um, Maybe you have your own thoughts on yeah, this. Yeah, I think the picture, of course, is probably more diverse. And uh, 
uh, even though the, the, the Her Excellency, His Excellency, he, he, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Georgia, Vashadze, mentioned that uh, what is good for Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, dealers or sellers, uh, uh, it's not always probably good for other countries. So the well, Mercedes-Benz dealers might feel that what's going on in Russia is completely fine. Uh, probably some other countries feel a little bit different. You can also sort of take it around and say that actually for many, exactly for many people, for many companies, for consumers of gas and oil in Europe, uh, Russia plays a certain kind of uh, indis indispensable regional su supplier of energy sources. If you look in Latvian energy balance, uh, the gas and oil is an important part of our consumption uh, patterns and uh, not always you can say that it's a negative thing that we have supplies. This is infrastructural and structural uh, some kind of uh, legacy of Soviet Union with some negative elements but also with some uh, stability actually involved before we develop some alternative things. So that's why of course uh, um, coming back to the discussion I think the emphasis was very much on political system and on uh, uh, values and I think in this case I would fully share the some kind of skepticism about the modernization agenda and how it could influence uh, Russia's political system and immediate integration into the value community of European Union or more wider Euro-Atlantic community. As, uh, as uh, uh, Yulia Latinina, one of the Russian uh, experts, critical experts, you might say as well, said that, you know, you cannot modernize Byzantine Empire, that, of course, uh, there, are, there, are, there are sort of the problems with the uh, values and political system, and I think it was very precisely, astutely uh, admitted. Should we, from but if the I NATO if side, change our values now or, or diminish a little bit the uh, demands we are putting as uh, something to be reached by Russians when they go their democratic way. Uh, you know, it also was like there should be a kind of, and then we are also always very scared that there will be double standards and mm. things like that, and Russia will play uh, push, uh, the double standards will actually be no democratic mm. at all at the end of the game. And should we really change the language from our side or still patiently waiting, maybe paying a little bit more to this oil bill that could bring some money for uh, this uh, change. Uh, so we don't need to pay at the end. Uh, Russians will pay. From well, let's see. Like this, uh, definitely there are different kind of tactics or strategies. And one of the tactics might be is that we are very assertive sort of in our positions. That we say, you know, Russia should integrate into the value community of Euro-Atlantic uh, value community if, if, if they want to participate in this modernization agenda. I think that at the moment, the another tactic has been uh, sort of um, accepted or, or, or chosen or selected, if you wish. Uh, namely that uh, I think the Western community has never given up, let's say, their values. And they are sort of the certain kind of benchmarks and human rights. And uh, I think this is still important. I would, I would always say that it is important part of sort of our community uh, European Union and NATO as well, and I don't think that we should give up. Of course, the question is, as I mentioned, about the language. Language now, there is a second, you can say, option. That now we should approach Russia probably with more engagement and pro probably more, again, if you may, with strategic patience uh, with Russia. Because coming back to, 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 to let's say, this uh, Russian dichotomy of politics and economics, as you mentioned, yes, politics, uh, as we discussed, politics have been not always uncontroversial. But if you speak about economics, Russia has developed. I mean, let's put the, let's put the data on the table. Uh, uh, during last decade, uh, Russia has doubled its GDP. Uh, Russia has pretty much satisfied many people, uh, let's say, their basic uh, economic or financial or social needs. And this we cannot also deny, in a sense. So to some extent, the social contract in Russia might seem it is a social contract if you provide us with a social, economic, financial stability. Probably in this case, uh, we are less active uh, and we are less uh, resistant about some kind of political system what exists in Russia. And then, of course, there is also the background of Yeltsin years, of 1990s, when democracy was pretty much uh, interpreted as instability and pretty much interpreted as unfairness and uh, political instability and, 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 and corruption. Yes, but coming back uh, exactly to uh, this, uh, how to deal with this um, regime, as they uh, call it now, the Putin's and Medvedev's uh, reality for last 10 years at least, uh, mm, is should we still 
or actually you can ask vice versa if we are not already in the positions of the double standards when we talk to Russia because there is Libya case there is another countries where uh, democratic standards and if you don't uh, um, scope with them then we impose um, economical um, sanctions with Russia it will, will never work of course uh, there yeah. was a small uh, try with a Chechnya in the <laughs> Council of Europe uh, 10 or 15 years ago and it never worked um, uh, that we are already in a position that because of energy flow uh, to Europe that is exactly from Russia we will be always in a different type of language uh, like with any other parts of, of the world so this makes us not neutral not uh, comfortable as um, the whole uh, NATO or European society or Western uh, society I guess yes and no on the one hand I think you rightly pinpointed that there are some kind of double standards but then probably I would rhetorically ask what we would do should we send the NATO bombers oh, to, <laughs> to to some other countries to well, so we to in Libya we did uh, uh, recently uh, to, to <laughs> exactly so of course there are about double standards international politics are about double standards what we do with China what we do with Russia what we do with uh, let's say the Middle East what we do with Syria at the moment I think it is a very important issue as well so of course uh, the double standards one thing but also there is some kind of pragmatism you can do something where you can do something i mean what you can do with russia so of course the pragmatism comes into the play as well uh, namely that you can not influence china if china wants to develop completely independently where you can start to influence russia in a sense when russia needs something from from the west and i think that why this is a quite a good moment as well because actually in 2008 russia didn't need anything from the west it was really assertive self-confident and self-confidence was growing that uh, it seemed for russia that only thing what uh, uh, what somebody needs is actually the russian energy resources in europe but uh, even today you have this feeling in even in this room that the only thing that we are ready to listen uh, to Russia is when they talk about energy prices, about you know sustainability of the energy flow and, and things like that. And now you should listen to all our recipes we like you Russians to do. Uh, democratic with a Western uh, style and, and wh whatever, you know, we, we kind of are also not mm. equally treating them uh, at the end. Well, it's difficult to say. I wouldn't say that we are not equally treating. Of course, again, it depends about the tactics and depends about the language and sort of diplomacy as well. And as I say, uh, I think there are different kind of, uh, not only Russia is in a sense diverse with its elements, but also there are diverse communities within European Union and NATO. And there is no just one kind of approach. And I think probably today we've seen more critical approach as you mentioned at the very beginning so uh, but what is important at the moment I think yes it's also a realization in Russia that Russia needs something Russia realized that uh, that economic and to some extent also political and you might say that it goes hand in hand uh, developments are unsustainable to some extent and Russia even though it was considered to be the island of stability until 2008-2009, actually out of G20 countries, Russia suffered the most. And then there was realization that there is a need for some kind of modernization. If you look in Russia, even though it was mentioned that, and it is one of the paradigms in Russia, even though modernization is perceived in Russia as a, actually the bridging technological gap. First of all, as Arkady Masha said, it's about technology, it's about technical things. It's not about some kind of values. I think there is increasingly also perception that it's not just about uh, technological gaps, that it's more about reforming society. You might say that it is probably to some extent artificial, you might say that it's part of political game, you might say that it is just some kind of uh, address the issues which some parts of society are willing to be addressed. At the same time it means that there is a uh, demand for such kind of perception that actually modernization is something more than just about bridging the technological gap. And this is connected with the people, or I think that even not with the people, but with ideas which somehow gradually have been developed around Medvedev and Igor Jurgens, and let's say the, the, the more Western liberals, as you may, even though there is no such a big difference, but at the same time I think these ideas, even though start to take their own uh, life, uh, and means that society probably is interested seeing some kind of other new ideas as well. And in this case, if Russia perceives there's some kind of um, need for coming closer to European Union, 
to NATO or general Euro-Atlantic values, to the, the political, but especially economic systems. In this case, I think there is also a chance for Europeans to start to make some kind of uh, criteria for the friendship, criteria for cooperation, criteria for engagement. That's it's why... It's mm -hmm. also time to organize themselves as Europeans. Don't you think so that we are still not organized or at least not using all, let's say, NATO-Russia Council or um, would it be, uh, you know, Barroso's visit instead of uh, Merkel's visit to Moscow? Now, still there is this uh, logic that Russia talks to each capital, not Brussels as a capital. Is it something that will change after the, our local euro crisis, uh, uh, that mm -hmm. we will be stronger as a union itself and then Russia will respect, uh, should respect uh, more Brussels as, let's say, a capital of un more united Europe in a few years, m most probably, and, and this should change. Probably it's a very interest of uh, small member countries, mostly, uh, but not only at the end. Uh, this could, you know, technically mean better price for everyone if uh, you agree a, a general European price of Russian gas, not a, a German tariff and the Italian and Latvian and whoever tariff. Yeah, the, the, I mean, you again, you pinpointed a very important uh, and actually fundamental issue what European Union is facing uh, in the past, also now and in the future. Uh, how to speak with a one voice, how to speak with a common voice and in terms of gas uh, yes there has been ideas about there have been ideas about a uh, single purchasing agency which would deal with all external supplies uh, at the same time yes of course but this is about nature of european union in a sense it consists of 27 countries and uh, the kissinger's question about where should i call what is a number for the foreign policy sort of coordinator in European Union. And I think it stands, probably it might be re-paraphrased that now there is some kind of operator who answers and say, if you want to speak with uh, <laughs> Catherine Asher, press number one, if you want to speak with president of uh, European Council, press number two, etc., etc. Uh, so, but anyway, I think we will not avoid the situation that European Union, despite the, these supranational, uh, supranational tendencies, you can still observe intergovernmentalism as well. And there are 27 countries countries with different structural, uh, not to speak about historical uh, backgrounds and experiences, because structurally, look, I mean, diversification for Portugal means something else, but diversification means for... This makes us weaker, weaker partner uh, okay. over the table if we are uh, like this. I mean, we cannot get economical profit, you know, the best tariff uh, for Russian gas or... Uh, I mean, we have to do our homework and then make, you know, the list of things we require uh, Russia to do. Well, uh, yes, you might say that that's true again, that uh, it would be nice if we would be able to speak with this common uh, common voice. And uh, uh, it has been some kind of problem that there is asymmetry, that Russia has always spoken from the positions of centralized power and positions of the strengths. Actually, the, the European Union has spoken from positions of, uh, I would not say immediately the weakness, but at least from the positions of fragmented voice. And it is a very important issue. At the same time, uh, you cannot expect immediate consolidation of those voices, but if you watch the recent developments, I am quite optimistic. Uh, crisis, what you mentioned in a sort of previous uh, question, is an important issue, because crisis are two things. I think crisis is always providing some window of opportunity for the countries, namely that you find the new mechanisms. European Union actually is always about finding new mechanisms, very slowly, not overnight, not that yesterday they spoke with a 27 voices, tomorrow they will speak with uh, one voice. But at the same time, crises provide opportunity for finding or trying to find or engaging political will, what everybody says. At the moment, it seems that it's a little bit of like political will, but crises actually might push a little bit this political will together. And then there is a chance that European Union will speak a little bit more with a uh, common voice. And if you observe during last years, uh, look, just, just one and I will finish with that. Oh, okay. um, look, the, the, the Polish, uh, Polish uh, negotiations on gas agreement with Russia, the European Commission was present. European Commission actually became more Polish than Poland itself. Yeah. Poland always been quite critical about the gas. Actually, European Commission played more critical role, saying, you know, you have to uh, accept the third party access. You have to pretty much confirm with the second or third energy package. This was, I think, a very important development, that there is step-by-step step incremental one, but there are developments in that direction. 
Do you the think that Russia now faces a weak uh, partner at the NATO Russia Council or uh, they don't take it as a realistic partner and they don't use it uh, this council at all when when Russia talks to to NATO they are happy with the setting we we are so divided and so different and so economically weak and so you know there are so many homeworks to do we don't care uh, so much about geopolitics or uh, um, anything else I think that it's again important issue that uh, the the exactly as you say that Russia is very happy to deal bilaterally Probably I would a little bit paraphrase the uh, uh, first part of the question, namely is that probably it's happy to deal not with uh, weak partners, but with incredible or credible partners. I think the important issue is how credible we are, how credible we are with dealing with crisis, how credible we are actually engaging in uh, dealing with human rights ab abuses a around the world, be it Libya, be it Syria, be it, be it Belarus, uh, how credible we are actually in terms of in NATO, how we deal with uh, Afghanistan. I think if you are credible, actually, this is a very important, I would say, symbolic uh, name in international politics. If you are credible, I think also there will be much more ability for European Union and NATO to speak from positions credible and strengths. Credible, but not very cooperative with Russia. I mean, in a sense of when there is a real job to do, let's say Libya, we don't like them to act uh, to help. Okay, they can vote in the in the UN's Security Council, but I was just thinking it was a NATO's operation. Why not joint operation? They've been talking about this uh, as a real example that there is no Cold War anymore. That you know we can do things uh, uh, together. I mean, that's the outside uh, reality, outside the NATO's uh, zone. Te technically, uh, uh, of course, there is a joint interest. So we don't trust still uh, yeah. to each other at, at the sense that we could do a joint operation. Of course we are, as we are coming back sort of to our discussion, the beginning of our discussions, uh, definitely we are, we are still different. We are in many, in, many, in many regards, we are quite different. As one of my Russian colleagues was saying, you know, Russia is not being integrated. It cannot be integrated because Russia integrates. There are elements of competition in, on many regards, also in, including in a former, former Soviet Union and neighborhood spaces. And there is still some kind of cooperation but at the same time also also uh, competition rivalry uh, but if you look I mean uh, many things I think depends on perspective because if you look what happened in 2008 in August and what is what it is happening in 2011 March so you would say that some kind of cooperation engagement has taken place and it has taken place if not immediately militarily at least politically you might say that uh, Libya is a political engagement case that's why decision. of course there are two two parties to tango. I think that Europeans have tried to tango. Uh, Russians, or Russian side, until 2008 and 2009, I think they were not so much willing to tango because they considered to them themselves quite assertive, important, and conf confidential in many cases. I think it has changed right now because crisis has hit them even harder than crisis has hit European Union. To a certain extent, To a yes. certain extent, to a certain course. extent. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Mr. Sprutz uh, thank you. works for the uh, Latvian Institute of uh, International Affairs uh, and uh, we will make a short break now to change uh, actually uh, for um, your colleague from Estonia. <laughs> yes. um, just in a short while Kadri Leek will uh, come to join uh, us uh, on debate and use a Twitter account and Facebook to, rea to react of what we've been saying or you heard uh, here in the room uh, during the day uh, earlier on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.